22nd and 23rd. So uh, with that, Don, I'd like to uh, introduce um, our speaker today, Brandy Coomer. Um, I've had the chance to get to know Brandy over the last several months, and I am confident that you're going to find her as delightful and knowledgeable as I have. Uh, Brandy, just a, a little bit of facts on, on Brandy. She has been actively supporting organizations' efforts to communicate their mission and gain donors, members, and volunteers. She's currently the Chief Interaction Officer for Identity, a product that helps organizations facilitate stronger communications and improve relations with their constituents by keeping their databases complete and current. She has authored and co-authored helpful publications, including one featured in Fundraising Success Magazine. Her volunteerism and leadership previously earned her the International Award for Well-Rounded Woman, presented by Altrusa. She serves as a public relations and marketing officer, active board member, and a member of local and national organizations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandy. Okay. Thank you, Kat. Okay, Brandy, it's there you go. We've got your screen now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, today I'm going to speak with you all a little bit about the importance that data quality has in your organization's ability to reach and develop good relationships with your constituents. There's a lot of hidden value in your database, but if your data is of poor quality, much of this opportunity is wasted. These opportunities lie in your organization's ability to connect and reach out to constituents in a variety of communication methods. These opportunities can be wasted if the data in your database is full of what we like to call data rot. So, is your database full of data rot? It's very likely that it is full of data rot if you're not regularly updating and maintaining your contact records. But what exactly is data rot? So, as I explain what data rot is and discuss some of the mis opportunities resulting from data rot, please feel free to use the chat option that they have made available to share some examples of how data rot has or may hurt your organization. So here you can see some of the signs of data rot. These signs can occur if you have bounced emails. So say if you utilize email marketing tools to maintain e newsletter subscribe lists which I'm sure you're all familiar with if you send out a lot of emails that you may have some bounce emails. Bounce emails are a really good indication that you may have outdated email addresses. You may experience wrong phone numbers. This can be an indication of data rot in a lot of ways because it could mean that the individual has moved. But in today's society, a lot of times, what simply has happened is an individual has dropped their red line and instead is choosing only to have a cell phone. This can be a particularly difficult situation for a donor because while we may have received a phone book in the mail, um, it doesn't have cell phone numbers in there. It just has the landline numbers. So if you have a wrong number or if someone has dropped their landline and picked up a cell phone number, you don't have a very good way to get a hold of them any longer. And then there in another example of data rot, I have listed return mail. And return mail can be a particularly costly form of engagement for a nonprofit. So if you're sending out an item like an annual report that may have many pages, it can be really costly to create and distribute those, especially if you end up with a lot of return mail. Some organizations may be relying on the return mailings to get updated addresses, but um, you need to take into consideration the costs associated with each piece of mail that is created in addition to those postage costs. So if it's a return, it's basically like throwing that donor money into the trash can. So I'd like to talk a, a little bit about some of the wasted opportunities that are in your database because not having up-to-date contact information can hurt your organization's ability to connect with constituents, but there's a lot of value in your database by simply understanding your constituents. 
So have you unintentionally sent out greeting cards to a deceased individual? Sometimes it can be quite embarrassing to send out a card made out to a couple when one has recently passed. This can cause holidays to be an even more strenuous time for those having lost a loved one. And we definitely do not want to be causing any unnecessary pain to our valued donors. You also may have experienced um, an, an instance where you could have sent out a relative wish to an individual, particularly like birthday cards. You know, prospective donors enjoy knowing that individuals and organizations care about them. So having the ability to perhaps send out a relevant card, you know, like a happy 50th birthday card, that means a lot to a person. It can really help connect you with that individual. And then here, another opportunity they have is perhaps the individual has graduated from college, perhaps one of their children have graduated. You know, you don't want to waste the opportunities to connect with your constituents. And you may have some of these clues in your database already. For example, um, you may have indicators that are letting you know that an individual has received a grant. You may have their age, their birth date. Um, any type of demographics in the database can be valuable, just as valuable, in fact, as contact information. So if you don't have this kind of information and these kind of clues to help you connect with individuals, be sure to get them. Now, do any of you have some examples that you can share of instances where you really wish that you would have had some form of information or um, you, you have experienced some issues where you have contact information that was out of date and you sent something to the wrong individual. I would really appreciate you sharing any of those types of things with us. So, why does this data rot? I wanted you to notice here at the, the bottom of the screen, I have included a few additional links periodically through the presentation that would provide you with some additional information relevant to what um, this slide says. In this particular instance, you can see here that uh, we have some additional information about data rot that has been provided by Third Sector today. and. Um, they are basically presenting some additional free online resource periodical where they are producing material that's relevant to nonprofits. And they particularly have published an informational piece about data rot, so you can learn more by going there. So basically, this overview contains some percentages of the annual amounts that data goes out of date. And these can be really startling because you really don't think about how frequently this information goes out of date. You know, people continue to move, they accept new jobs, they change the methods of communication. All these things can cause your database to go out of date. So you can see here that 34% of Americans create a new email address. People may have used an email just provide by the college for a time. Um, they may have opted to utilize a free email address. Sometimes individuals will just use an email address provided by their ISP and then later decide to switch ISPs. Sometimes an email address just goes out of date because, you know, they, it gets flooded with spam and the person's like, oh, I just had enough of this email and they get rid of that one and get a new one. So it happens a lot. 34% um, of Americans create them each year. And then here the next percentage is that 18% of mobile and landline phone numbers change each year. Um, these changes occur for, you know, as I mentioned before, the fact that people will drop landlines to pick up cell phone numbers. And then we're all aware of how frequently people move, um, especially individuals trying to get new jobs, um, perhaps they got married. Um, sometimes your donors in particular may have simply purchased a, a vacation home. So the, or only away for part of the year. So they're like a snowbird, say perhaps I'm from Indiana and I know in our area a lot of individuals will go south for the winter time, like to Florida or something. Well, you need to know where they're at so that you can make sure that you're sending any kind of mailers out to the relevant address. And then unfortunately about 1% of people pass away annually. So it's really important to know if a person has passed or not, so that you're not continuing to call for them or send mailers to their address. And basically, because of these changes, the majority of contact records in your CRM over time 
can develop data rot unless you are maintaining them. So here are some of the consequences of data rot. In general, it limits the effectiveness and profitability of every organization's operations, campaigns, donor relations, fundraisers, and constituent analysis. So here in campaigns, you can see that emails are one of the most inexpensive forms of communication. But if your emails are bouncing, constituents are not going to know about the latest community project, your new online donation platform, or any upcoming events. So it's really important to have those email addresses be up to date so that people can know about a recent campaign. I mean, if you send out mailers and, and they're returned, you know, it's an, another one of those missed opportunities. If you have a, a donor that has dropped a landline for a cell phone, you can't call and thank them for that large donation that they may be making. If you're engaged with phone drives, you may be wasting a lot of time on long numbers that could have been spent taking donations. And then um, your donor relations can be affected because nonprofits are familiar with the importance of the telling the story. Donors want to know how their donations are spent. In fact, I recall hearing a pain point an organization shared in that they were providing scholarships to high school grads, but then they lost contact with them through the college years. So, for example, the, the individual perhaps switched to an Ivy League school at some point in time, and um, maybe the relatives moved or, or they just transferred or perhaps they excelled greatly in their career and they moved away. Um, the donors never know that that donation that they made to the individual really made a difference in someone's life. So it's really important to remain in contact not only with the donor but also with any individual that perhaps you've made a grant to or have donated to in some way because it helps you to build a relationship and tell the story that you had to the donor to develop that donor relationship. And then your fundraisers, of course, are um, affected by data rot because if you don't have that phone number, if you don't have an email, you can't, you can't follow up with individuals. Um, I've heard some stories about individuals that are making donations to these silent auctions and here, this, this nonprofit has all of these new people that they never had any previous contact with, and they're bidding thousands of dollars on some item, and the only way they can talk to them is by the cell phone number that they have. So you need to be able to connect with them in an, another manner. You know, you might want to be able to follow up with them some other way, and you might not even know who they are. So there's all these ways that you could be getting additional information so that you can connect with these potential donors. And then um, some additional issues with data rot lie in the fact that it limits your ability to reach out and understand donors. It's, it's not just about contact information. You need to know about your donors as well. You need to know things such as where they're from, when their birthday is, what's their estimated wealth. It's, it's not just about that contact information. If demographics are missing, you're missing so many opportunities to connect. Knowing where your donors are from can help you determine interest in supporting a community project. Knowing the birthday or age can help you show, you know, like I mentioned before, that you care. You may find all kinds of opportunities to ask for donations or even larger donations if you simply know that the individual may be able to spare a little bit more. So overall, Improving relations can help exceed fundraising goals. Eliminating the data rot can improve your constituent relations and help your organization exceed these goals. So for example, an open email is an opportunity to let your constituents know in a cost-effective way that you're launching a campaign or may have an upcoming gala. Successful phone calls, um, I've heard things like nonprofits say that they don't really call constituents, but why not? You know, it doesn't really cost anything other than the time to pick up that phone and call a constituent. And a successful phone call can really mean a powerful connection between the organization and a, a potential donor. 
And then if your organization is about mailers requesting donations, of course you want to be sure that you're reaching as many potential donors as possible. But mailers are the same as emails and phone calls, and that if you can't reach an individual, they won't know to donate. There's a sub substantial amount of value in your database, but if there's missing or outdated info, there's also missing opportunities to connect. So, you know that you have rot in your database, and you need to know what to do about it. Before I move along about how to remove the raw and some really easy and cost-effective ways to increase your really, does anybody have any questions about data rot? Okay, if not, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about um, some of these cost-effective ways. And some of the more common things that people are doing to get rid of um, any kind of data rot that they have. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about NCOA, that's the National Change of Address, um, updating information yourself, and utilizing any kind of data enhancement services. So let's go ahead and first start talking about the NCOA. It's a requirement for mass mailings in order to receive any kind of bulk mail discounts. Um, FedCap.org provided some statistics about um, the requirements for using this, and it must be performed within 95 days of mailing. It must be 70% accurate, and if you don't meet those requirements, you could face a penalty. The nice thing about NCOA is that it's a relatively inexpensive service. Um, if you you know, you may be sending out mailers to like 5,000 individuals, and it may be something that's cost effective for your organization because of that simple fact of, you know, if you're going to be sending out this large pamphlet, it's really important to know if the information, the, the addresses that you have are up to date before you end up sending out all of these mailers. The question is, is just doing the NCOA update enough? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of NCOA. Now, one of the, the biggest problems that, that I've seen is the fact that NCOA is not standardized addresses. Standardization is a requirement, and you can see here, um, I have some screenshots here of the, the manual. Um, this is just the table of contents that is provided for the standardization. This is really lengthy. It was, it was kind of overwhelming, really, to look at this and how much information there is about just standardization. Um, and if it's not standardized, it's, it's simply not going to be delivered. So you have to make sure that it's standardized. Now, some other limitations of NCOA that you might face is um, the fact that up to 40% of all movers do not even report to the NCOA. So you don't have to, like, notify the post office that you're moving. So what happens if your top donor doesn't report that they're moving? You could, you could lose contact with them if you're only using the NCOA. Now, another um, thing that you can run into is the fact that it only checks for the last 24 to 48 months. Um, you, you can pay extra to get it to check for that 48 months. But what happens if you lost contact with um, an individual several years ago, um, especially like if, if you haven't done anything in, in many years, how are you going to find those lost contacts? So that's one um, really downfall of NCOA. It's just the simple fact that just a lot of the times it doesn't go back far enough. You, you might have an address that's several years old, and how are you going to get the new one? And then um, it, it also doesn't contain additional forms of communication. So while you're just getting updates to the addresses, you're not getting phone numbers, email addresses, um, any kind of social media accounts or employment information. Um, I just out of curiosity, I'm wondering, have any of you all utilized NCOA? And it would be great if you could share any kind of stories that you've had with whether it's been a positive experience or a negative experience. So I wanted to talk a little bit, too, about updated emails. Many organizations, you know, you, you may already have the addresses and the phone numbers due to past communications, but you may have had trouble gathering emails from constituents. 
some of this is simply because they didn't originally gather this info or perhaps you're just jotting down emails over the phone. I, I know I'm notorious for um, writing things down and then I don't write it down correctly. So then I've got to go back and, you know, what are you going to do? You have to find this email address. So with the lack of emails, you, you may decide that you just want to locate these emails yourself. But you have to be aware of doing this as well because you may fall into spam traps, honeypots. Um, you could be banned from your email marketing company or ISP for sending out too many bad emails. I know that some organizations will send out emails from Outlook, so you can really run into some problems there if you're sending out too many bad ones. You could find yourself in a situation where you're just unable to contact an individual because you attempted to contact too many of the wrong individuals and you may not be notified that a particular person has marked you as spam and you will no longer be receiving emails from your organization in their inbox. So um, one of the things that you need to consider in updating info yourself is whether or not it's worth the cost. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can update contact information yourself. Um, as I mentioned with emails, you, know, you, you might be doing some sort of manu uh, manual search. I've heard some stories too about um, looking for deceased individuals that sometimes um, organizations will spend every single day looking through obituaries. Um, you could find people who have passed away perhaps you know, in your, your local community, but if you have donors that are outside of your community, you know, how are you going to know that those individuals have passed away? Now, there's also um, just some basic web searches. Um, I've heard some examples of organizations taking time, you know, after hours to look for updated contact information. And um, you may choose to um, engage with some paid searches. Some of these don't really cost too much, but it still takes a lot of time and you're still faced with this issue of, is it the right person? You'd be surprised how many individuals with the same name live in a general area. Um, you, you're never going to really know if it's the right one. I know, just using myself as an example, sure, Brandon is a common name, but Kumar, that's not really that common of a name. But here, where I'm located in Indiana, there are three other Brandy Coomers in this area. And um, even one of them, one of my associates that lives clear out on the East Coast, he actually has a friend who knows the other Brandy Coomer in Indiana, and she even works within the same vertical that I do. So it, that's not even a common name. Like if you would have like a John Smith or something, how many of these could you come across? And would you find the right person? So it can overall be a really time-consuming thing and it can um, even be costly but so say you, you take the cost out of it all say you are just having unpaid interns or other forms of free labor doing this their their sole task while you're using them is to just update your contact information now you can you, you could do this, but do you really want to do this? I mean, isn't there something else that they could be doing? They could be like organizing, strategizing. Um, they could be participating in fundraisers and other events. They could be making your organization money instead of spending all this time looking for this information. So you really have to weigh out, you know, is it worth the time to just do it yourself? Um, also, I, I know that I've seen a lot of requests for updated contact information. This is a really common one, too. You know, you may be sending out emails, you know, please update your contact information. Um, I know that some organizations will have, um, like, a form on their website requesting for updated contact information. Now, this, this can be a really great idea, pending individuals actually will put the information in. And sometimes a return on this kind of um, request for updated information can really return some minimal results. So if you do decide to have your staff or unpaid interns update this information, it's, it's really something that has to be considered because your staff is really hyperextended. I know most nonprofits, they're not only running on a limited budget, but they're also running on limited staff. And so they may, um, 
decide that it's best to go ahead and utilize staff to do something more meaningful for the organization. Now, um, it could be a fact that you find that updating the information yourself is just a complete distraction from your core mission. You know, your organization could be developing these donor relationships, strategizing for a new fundraiser, or just organizing a community project. So it's really, it, it seems cost effective at first, but it's really important to consider in the long run, is this really something that you want to be doing? After, you know, that you realize it's something that needs to be done. It can't just sit there. So then um, there's, there's also the option to utilize a data enhancement services. Um, sometimes, you know, you might think, you know, utilizing a service, you know, some outside company to come in and uh, do this contact information. Is it really saving time and money? And how, how can this be? You know, how can it be that this is something that could be cost effective in contrast to just utilizing some, some of my unpaid interns or some volunteers? You know, just as like a recap, how are you going to find this missing and added contact information? There, there aren't cell phone directories, there aren't email directories, there's definitely not demographic directories. Somehow, you're going to be trying to find this information. So you want to spend all the hours associated with looking for updated addresses, waiting for this return mail to come in, searching for phone numbers, and just scouring obituaries. Sometimes it takes actually sitting down and looking for the contact information to, to really like understand how much time that it could be actually taken away from the organization. It could take, you know, as, as little as 10 minutes to find someone, but it, it could take hours. Um, you, you could be looking at phone books, um, but once you're in the phone book, you're going to find addresses and land lines. You're not going to find those email addresses with cell phone numbers. And then if somebody has moved within the last year, you know, how are you going to find them? It's just, it can be a really cumbersome thing to try and find this outdated information. So that's why some organizations have turned to data enhancement services to try to help out update this info. But, um, you know, if you haven't utilized some sort of enhancement service, it can be a really scary thing. You know, first of all, you're giving them your contact information. Um, that, that can be a scary thing in itself. Um, but you, you also have to understand what kind of things that that enhancement service should be doing. So they should be cleaning and standardizing your data. If you have something that's not formatted, um, they need to provide a means to fix it. It's ideal if they have a way to show any duplicates that you have. It's, it's not necessary, you know, for them to actually merge the information. You know, that might, um, in fact, mess up your your orange sleep database if they were to, to merge the information. You know, you, you just need to know that that's available so that you can see, okay, I have John Smith as a donor and I have John Smith as um, having previously re received a scholarship or a grant or something like that. Um, they would also be able to provide updated data and fill in any missing information that you have. And then ideally, they would provide you with an estimate of how much data they might be able to update. Um, that's always good to know because, um, you know, we like to know what we're going to be getting. And so additionally, an upfront pricing is really useful. And um, you don't want to be in one of those situations where you expect you to pay a certain amount to update the data or append some, some missing information only to receive a bill that was much higher than what you had originally anticipated. So these are just a few points of what you should look for in enhancement service if you haven't used one in the past. So just this, um, you know, a recap about removing the, the raw out of your database and why it's so beneficial. So once you remove the raw, with and from whichever way you choose, um, you know, what does this really mean for your organization? It means when you can reach your constituents the first time, not after you've called their relatives, trying to track down the right John Smith. You know, you, you might have called um, their children or their parents or, or something of the sort. You know, once you get that rod out there, you can reach them the very first time. 
you can uh, reach them using a variety of communication methods. You can really develop those relationships when you're able to contact them in multiple ways. And you would have the ability to actually reach individuals and turn them prospects into actual donors and volunteers. Which that's what we really are, are seeking. You, know, you may have a lot of contacts in your database that aren't donating and aren't volunteering. And you know, once you stop and think about why, it could really be something as simple as just that it is out of date. Um, you'd be surprised like how quickly you can start increasing the revenue of your organization just by simply updating this contact information. So uh, I would like to encourage you all to, you know, really be a savvy leader. Um, many organizations are using data enhancement services. Um, some are, are, you know, still updating contact information themselves or they're using a COA. But regardless of what you try to use, you know, be savvy about it and, you know, understand and learn more about the, the donor pool that you have. It, it's really important to be proactive about your engagement and utilize multiple channels. You know, don't just send out the mailers. You know, follow up with these people. You know, call them, um, email them, let them know what's going on. There's, there's really a lot of value that you have sitting in these databases. Just make sure that that data is up to date so that you can reach them. Um, some of the, the various ways that you can communicate, you know, once again, you think about um, like social media. You could, um, for example, be communicating using social media. I know that's kind of a new one sometimes that not all nonprofits have utilized, but you, you may be sending out like newsletters to individuals and you can reach out to them on social media or vice versa. So it's really important to utilize all the different kind of communication strategies that are available. And then of course, you know, learn about your donors, learn what kind of things they're interested, learn, learn something as simple as just how old they are. So once you've increased this reachability, it leads to improved relations. Um, you have to be able to reach a person to ask for a donation. And once they gift, the communication must continue. You can follow up with the donor to tell them the story, as I mentioned. You have to be able to reach an, an individual to develop the relationship and turn them into donors and keep them donating and volunteering. And the, the best way to encourage this is to continue to be able to communicate with them. So I. I wanted to share with you um, some examples of other organizations that have been utilizing, you know, a variety of ways to reach with individuals. And as a result of um, having updated data, they were able to do some extra things. So here you can see um, Act for Alexandria. They have stated that um, after using email updates, they were able to raise an additional 900% more than the, the previous year. So what they did is they spent this extra time and money creating like a really meaningful video. And they spent time on email messaging and launching an effective campaign. So they, they didn't just get the updated data, they did something with it, which is really um, essential. You, you have the data, you have to put it to use, and um, doing something like really exciting, something new, can really help, as you can see, 900% more than the previous year. So then I have a, another example. Um, this community foundation in Boone County, they, they too had used a, a data enhancement service, and they um, were able to complete in a few hours what would have taken them a month to complete. So they saved that staff time. They saved postage costs because they could send up the mailer and just have a bunch of them return. <laughs> and um, they found confidence in some of the reports that they pulled. So they can be certain that the demographic information is, is accurate and up to date. So, um, do you have data rot? Um, are you experience, experiencing bounced email addresses, um, wrong phone numbers, and return mails? 
um, if you are experiencing these things, you know, it's, it's good to realize how much more successful your campaigns could be if you had accurate and up-to-date constituent information instead of just writing data. Um, you can increase online campaigns and donations. Um, you can increase responses and donations from mailers. And you can be certain that you reach out and follow up with your constituents. And that's, that's all I have for you all. Um, I hope that um, if you have any additional questions, you'll definitely reach out to me. Um, I do have my email address and my phone number included here, so feel free to ask um, any questions, but I would be more than happy to answer any questions that any of you have right now as well. Well, great, Brandy. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. We do have a little bit of time. And so if there are any questions from the audience, please use the question box and I will relay those to Brandy. I thought it was, I, I was uh, personally, Brandy, I was kind of blown away by the stats that you gave early on about 34% having new mm -hmm. email addresses, 18 phone changes, and 11% of all addresses are bad. I, I kind of had a gut feel about the addresses, but I was really surprised about the phone number and the the email changes. Oh, sure, sure. It's definitely, it's just, it's a shock when you really see that the national statistics, you know, of how frequently these people are are changing things. I know, like with just myself, I have a lot of different email addresses. Um, I I don't know why. If like some people are more prone to creating new email addresses, you know, obviously if you switch jobs, you would have a different email address. But it's it's kind of unusual the frequency with which people create new email addresses. And if you don't have the right one, you you might not be contacting them. I know that. Um, sometimes I only check some of my email addresses. You know maybe once a month. So if somebody's sending email to that one, it's going to be a rarity that I actually see it. So um, with Updentity, the company that you work for, uh, how do they assist in keeping the data up to date? Sure. We do provide data updates. We, um, we fill in missing contact information, any kind of demographic information. I think overall we have probably about um, very close to 1,000 fields available. So we have, you know, the standards, emails, phones, addresses, but we also have some um, some really drilled down information that's available that can help you understand, you know, a, a date of birth is, is great and so it is the estimated wealth that some um, organizations, particularly say like you're an environmental organization, you, you might be interested in knowing um, which ones of your constituents are particularly interested in um, conserving water, um, the various forms of water conservation. There's there's different types of things that people are interested in, and we can provide that information to help you understand and um, maybe make more meaningful contact to individuals. Um, I, I've heard a lot of things about you know donor fatigue. You know we're always reaching out to the same donors. You know, but with some demographic information, you might be able to reach out to specific donors that are interested in that particular cause that you're supporting at that time. Great, and uh, another question. Are your services geared towards small, medium, or only very large nonprofits? Oh, no. It, it doesn't matter the size. Um, we've worked with very small organizations um, and then some very large ones as well. We base um, pricing on the number of contacts that you have. So if you're a small organization, you, your, your cost would be a lot lower than a very large organization. So it's affordable regardless of your size. Great. Um, last call for any other questions from our audience. Thank you so much for not being shy and and asking Brandy some questions here. Um, it looks like a wrap. Brandy, thank you so much for presenting today. We really appreciate the information that you shared with us. Thanks to everybody in the audience for uh, joining us this afternoon. We did record this, and it will be up on the Orange Leap blog um, by tomorrow, if not sooner. And oh, we uh, one of our audience members passed along a compliment. Fantastic job, Brandy. 
So thank thanks everybody. And we will see you next month. Bye-bye.